Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Lake County. We are an inclusive, non-credal fellowship that works for a just community and fosters a lifelong search for personal spiritual fulfillment. Here at UUCLC, we value making a difference in ourselves, our community, and even the world. I'm Janine Reagan, and I'm honored to be your service leader this morning. And I'm joined by Reverend Bird Tesloff, who will deliver her sermon today entitled, It's Turtles All the Way Down. That's pretty intriguing. But first we have some announcements. Be sure to check out the weekly service bulletin attached to your Sunday service email. There are many UU activities and groups meeting on Zoom this week. Now is the time to make a difference by getting involved in some of our community uh, communities and some of our groups. <clears throat> we have many very active groups to meet your needs. <clears throat> Excuse me. As we start to reopen, even more opportunities will be available. In fact, some of our communities and groups will be moving back into the building uh, this month, and we hope to have our first service in our sanctuary on September 5th with David Crump as our speaker, so mark your calendar. But for now, we continue on Zoom. We ask that you remain muted during most of the service unless you're called on to share. If you're interested in receiving our weekly bulletin or learning more about us, please send an email to office at lakecountyuu.net or leave your email in the chat so that we can contact you. 
Our service is being recorded, except for joys and concerns and the discussion period that follows the service. You will find this service and several of the earlier services on our YouTube channel, UU CLC Office which you can also access on our weekly bulletin or our website, which is at lakecountyuu.net. The chat box on Zoom is open. You may take some time at this point early in the service to enter a joy or concern, which is just too tender to speak aloud, and it will be read during that part of the service. You may also enter a donation into the fund funding link, which is also in the chat box. Today, immediately after our service, we will have our discussion time, which offers you a chance to comment on the service topic and ask questions of Reverend Birch, who will be staying with us for a while, or you can discuss other topics that are on your mind. Our treasurer, Christina Wilkins, has an announcement for us today. Christina? Thank you, Janine. Uh, as your treasurer, I wanted to bring you up to date as to the results of our board meeting this past week relative to our budget that was approved with some minor adjustments for our new 2022 year. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that because we were able to generate some excess funds this past year due to us not being in the building, we were able to set up an emergency reserve fund and also to begin our capital <laughs> reserve fund, which is something that is extremely prudent over the long term. However, when we were looking at what our pledges have been for this new fiscal year, it turns out that fewer people were able to pledge or remembered to pledge for the new fiscal year. And we're just asking that anyone who has not had an opportunity to please pledge whatever amount you're comfortable pledging and all you need to do is send an email to me. There is a, uh, a small article in the Sunday Bulletin today that gives you my email address and what little information I need from you. It will help us greatly to achieve uh, being able to pay for all of the expenses now that we're going to be going back into the building and many of those expenses that we were able to cut back on significantly, we won't be doing since we'll all be in the building again. So thank you for all of your continued support. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Does anyone else have an announcement? If so, please wave your hand and someone will call on you. No announcements? I don't see any. Okay. Oh, wait. Audrey has one. Audrey has an announcement. And you're muted, Audrey. I just wanted to know when does the fiscal year begin or end? Or... Audrey, our fiscal year begins July 1st of each year okay. and goes until June 30th of next year. So if I, I, if I pledged, I don't know, in November or something like that, does it continue uh, with the monthly amount that I've uh, specified or? Uh, it, it depends on for how many months you indicate you want the automatic payment to be made. And Audrey, I would be most happy to assist you in setting that up in the manner in which you would like. Okay, well, we don't have to do that whatever, whatever if we could do that in private. Yep. Certainly. Okay. Enough said. 
I don't see anyone else. Okay, thanks, Chris. Welcome to all. If you are a first time visitor or perhaps returning after an absence, if you're comfortable doing so, I invite you to wave your hand at the camera like that. So all can see you. A member of our tech staff will call on you and then you may unmute and introduce yourself and tell us what brought you here today. Do we have any visitors or anybody returning? I don't see any hands, Janine. Okay, thanks, Chris. Today, we welcome back Reverend Bird Tesloff. Reverend Bird has been with us several times during our time of virtual services. She comes to us from South Bend, Indiana, and Reverend Bird is a retired UU minister who maintains an animal ministry. And she does her art in the form of beautiful mandalas. She is also providing pastoral care for our congregation. You can call or email Reverend Bird if you would like to talk to a minister on a one-to-one -one basis. You can contact her by phone to chat or to set up a Zoom meeting with her. Her number and email are available in today's chat box. Reverend Bird will now light our chalice. Hello. 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 Uh, my light just went out. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I have a fan on, so my apologies. We gather this hour as people of faith with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, a sign of our quest for truth and meaning and the life we share together. <laughs> Since today I'm going to be talking about creationism and science, I thought I would begin by paraphrasing the first chapter of Genesis, just to remind you what we're dealing with. Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And the earth was without form and void. And God called together the waters and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree, yielding fruit after its kind. And it was so. And God created whales and every living creature that moved beneath the waters. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures. And it was so. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So God created man, male and female, created he them.
Each Sunday we make time for those who wish to offer a joy, a concern or a sorrow, <clears throat> or to set intention for the coming days. This portion of our service will not be recorded. As we share joy, it multiplies. Please join me in reaffirming who we are by reciting together our congregational covenant found on the screen. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. It is our practice to give generously in our church as we are able and keep in mind both its meaning and our lives and its impact on the world. We are thankful to all who provide financial support for UUCLC. In order to continue our virtual services and keep our beautiful building protected and ready for our return, we ask for whatever financial support you can provide. There are multiple ways to do this, which are found on the slide in the Sunday Service Bulletin or our UUCLC website. You can also donate from the link in the chat box right now, right today. So thank you for your donations. Our reading this morning is What If? And it's fairly long, so I suggest you get comfortable. God in his wisdom invented the fly, but then forgot to tell us why, according to Ogden Nash. We humans make a lot of assumptions about God and creation. We tend to think that this was all made just for us that we are the whole point of creation. But what if, just what if it wasn't like that at all? What if there was no plan, no well thought out scheme? What if creation came about because God was bored one day and decided to see what would happen if she made water and sunlight and stars? What if she had no idea what would come next and couldn't wait to find out? What if life itself came about purely by accident and surprised her? Maybe she just tossed a primordial marble down an infinite cosmic path and it gathered the equivalent of moss and stardust as it rolled. She may be endlessly enthralled at the results, but not necessarily controlling it. What if God is merely a self-aware form of the forces and laws of nature, which even now we only dimly understand a tiny fraction of? We make some outrageous assumptions about the creator. We assume that she is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. We assume that she has never made a mistake. But knowing what we know about this planet alone, why would we assume that? Figuring out the laws that move the universe doesn't necessarily mean that she knows where a particular squirrel would bury the acorn that would grow into a life-generating tree. It doesn't mean that she can stop an earthquake or change a human heart. Why would we think that she can? And what is so remarkable or noteworthy about humans that she would take special notice of us? If she cares at all about this particular planet, I would think the most important species would be the earthworm. We humans have a lot of hubris to tell God what she has to be, what she has to care about, and what her priorities should be. 
We insist that she be in control and that she be perfect. But what if she is not? I invite you now to join with me for a moment of reflection or meditation. I invite you to soften your eyes and relax your body. Get comfortable and join with me if you will for seven deep breaths, taking in love and hope and breathing out the same to those around you. Come back now to this time and place, to the hymn we sing of golden mornings.
I want to talk to you today, today a little bit about creationism, a little bit about Christianity, and a little bit about science, and hopefully how they might relate to one another. My first church was smack dab in the middle of the Bible Belt. And one of the issues we were constantly dealing with was that creationism was often being taught in the schools. Yes, yes, I know, it's supposed to be illegal to teach religion in a public school, but this was Tennessee, where it is illegal to teach evolution. In 2021, Today, it is still illegal to teach evolution there. So although they didn't actually teach creationism in the public schools, they might as well have. And it certainly came out frequently. Now, just to remind you, creationism is the belief that the world was created just the way it says in the Bible. But this raises a number of rather interesting issues that are sometimes sidelined by its proponents. Most of you are very familiar with the first couple of stories in Genesis, where God creates the world as we know it. Interestingly enough, in my Bible study class, it is said that there are actually 17 creation stories in the Bible, in the Old Testament alone. I've only located six of them, but the first two are the ones most folks talk about, Genesis chapter one and two. And the reading this morning was a paraphrase of the first chapter. The second chapter, which is a different story of creation, we find that God has created a beautiful garden of Eden and placed man in it. But it is just man. Somehow the first woman got lost. Of course, then you can get into the whole Lilith mythology, which is great fun. But for now, let's just go with a man standing alone in the garden. And God feels sorry for him and wants to create a companion for him. So. God creates woman. Now, I call your attention to the fact that in both of these versions of creation, God is actually following pretty much an evolutionary path. It's a layered creation working up to the apex, starting with the humblest parts first, water, land, sea critters, plants, animals, finally humans. But since God is creating things in reverse order of importance, plants, animals, then man, and woman is created last, well, I leave the theological implications up to you. The next part is fairly important to the monotheological trilogy of religions, the Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Eve, the first woman, tries the apple from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She likes it. And then she hands the apple to Adam. She does not trick him. She does not bribe him or coerce him in any way. She just holds out her hand with the apple in it and he takes it. When God confronts them about eating the apple, Adam blames God as well as Eve. He says, the woman God whom thou madest, she beguiled me. The woman, however, takes responsibility for her actions. She openly admits, I did eat. In the monotheistic traditions, she condemns us with that. This is the original sin, 
to have disobeyed God's commandment. And humans are thrown out of the Garden of Eden. <laughs> but in other religious traditions that were prevalent at the time, they have a completely different understanding of the same story. According to them, by her brave act of defiance, Eve frees us from the prison of paradise. A very different understanding indeed. There are a couple of other picky issues about the story in Genesis that I can't resist bringing up, so please forgive me. Most creationists are totally convinced that the world was created in just six days, because on the seventh, God rested. Now, I'd like to point out a couple of things here. For one thing, it's not the entire universe that was made in six days, just the Earth with our sun and moon. There's no definitive statement on whether or not the rest of the universe was already plugging along. It may have been. And if so, well, that makes the time frame a whole lot easier on God. But even if it's just the Earth, six days, well, that's not a lot of time to accomplish so much. But in Psalms, we're told 10,000 years, O Lord, are to thee as but a day when they are past. So the concept of just how long a day is seems to be rather flexible. A few million years here or there, what difference does it make? From God's point of view, it's all just a blink of the eye. And to give credit, Genesis stories do tend to follow a prescribed evolutionary path as to what order things come to be. I'll give them that. Another little detail that's almost always overlooked is what is God actually saying? God says, and I quote, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Who is God talking to? I mean, God is talking to someone throughout all of creation. I've heard it proposed that God is using the editorial we. Nope, that wasn't invented when the Bible was written. You have to wait almost a thousand years for an editorial we. And the early writers were very literal. God is talking to someone. And that's kind of problematic. I mean, there's supposed to be no one there except God, right? But later on in the Bible, there are two possibilities mentioned as to who might be keeping God company. The first is his wife. Oh, yes, according to the Bible, God had a wife. Her name was Asherah. And archaeologists have found many small altars to her in ancient Hebrew homes. She was even worshipped in the great temple of Israel. And you can read about her in the Book of Kings. Another possibility is his sons. That's right, sons, plural little godlets running around. They're referred to in several places. Genesis tells us that the sons of God looked down on the daughters of men and took many of them as wives. We are told their children became heroes of old. Job tells us that the sons of God were gathered at his feet as he told stories or wagered with Satan. And God reprimands Job later in the same book when he was talking about creation. He asked Job, 
Where wast thou when all the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy? So God was not alone during creation. But in all honesty, we don't have to disprove or explain these understandings of the beginnings of all things. It's not our job to tell others what to believe. And besides, creation stories all around, they abound in cultures. And most of them, frankly, are fun and often quite delightful. One of my favorite stories is from India, where the world was created as a giant disk of earth riding on the back of an elephant. And the elephant is standing one leg on each of four turtles. And of course, there's the Sunday school child who asks, but then, what are the turtles standing on? And the frustrated Sunday school teacher replying, other two are turtles. And what are they standing on? It's turtles all the way down. Thus the title of this sermon. Creation stories are charming as long as they're not taught in schools in place of science. That's really my only beef with creationists. They can believe whatever they want, just don't teach it in church, in, in schools, as science. But it is an issue. And it is being taught in some places, especially in private schools. Why? Well, you may notice that even though it was written in the Hebrew part of the Bible, it is not the Jews who are insisting that creationism is the truth. It is the Christians. They absolutely need the whole Garden of Eden to make their theology work. Why do some Christians need Adam and Eve? A, a lot of Unitarians simply do not understand this. Now, most of us here are not Christians, but a goodly number of us think that Jesus was a wise teacher and had some really good ideas on how to get along with one another. We tend to like him and think that he may have been a pretty good guy with real insight into the human heart and mind. To most of us, regardless of whatever theology is superimposed on him by others, we think he taught some very positive lessons that don't need the theology to prop them up. So we tend not to understand why fundamentalist Christians, not all Christians, thank heavens, just the fundamentalists, we tend to not understand why fundamentalists need Adam and Eve in order to have Jesus. But it's this way. For the fundamentalists, Jesus is not merely a wise teacher. Jesus was not sent to impart wisdom on how to live our lives. No, he may have done that. But Jesus was sent here for one reason and one reason only. Jesus was here to save us from sin. And not just any sin. Remember that Adam and Eve were sent out of the Garden of Eden? because they disobeyed God? Well, that disobedience is called original sin. And we all have it because that sin passes down to all of us as their descendants. We inherited it. That means we're all going to hell unless we can be saved. And that is the sin Jesus paid for with his suffering, according to them original sin. All other sins come from that one. 
But if there is no Adam and Eve, then there's no original sin. And if there's no original sin, there is no need for Jesus, according to them. So, yeah. Adam and Eve are kind of important. Our universalist ancestors were really bucking the waves when they started teaching that we are all saved. What daring. What courage to believe that God was actually on our side, that Jesus came to give us some guidelines to help make this earth, this experience, more paradise-like. It's easy to find fault with the beliefs of early humans. Where would they get the idea that we started out in a paradise that we stupidly got thrown out of? Well, as my wise friend Ivan says, truth is what we work with until a better truth comes along. He points out that science and religion have a common root, the need for explanations and answers. Humans need explanations and answers. Some of us have figured out that most things have causes, and we'd like to know some of those causes. To ancient man who had only his own experiences and very limited ability to explore the possibilities, they had to reach to find the answers. Okay, the sun rises. What causes that? They posited the idea there must be a God that makes it happen. And it fit the evidence because there wasn't much evidence and God fit the evidence humans had at the time. Most of us here buy the Big Bang Theory. But what caused the Big Bang? We don't know. So for some of us, God caused the Big Bang. It fits the evidence. Just as saying there is no God. And something that we don't know yet caused it. Because that also fits the evidence. We just don't know. In the end, I have no definitive answers for you on how this all got started. Did God just wave a magic wand? Or did some unexplained physical phenomenon that we have no explanation for just now, did that phenomenon start at all? Maybe it is just turtles all the way down. I can only speak for my personal beliefs. Me, I'm kind of a creationist because I buy the Big Bang Theory and evolution and whatever else the scientists come up with. Because my understanding of God is that she uses science to do her work. It fits the evidence. Just as believing that there is no God at all fits the evidence. We do what we can. So be it. I've seen Jesus play with flames in the lake of fire and I was standing in Met the devil in Seattle Spent nine months inside the line Then Met Booty yet another time he Showed me a glowing light within But I 
swear to God is there every time I go to the eyes of my best friend. Since my son, it's all been done. Someday you're gonna wake up old and gray. Go and try and have some fun. Show and warmth to everyone. Need and greet, cheat along the way. There's a gateway in our minds that leads somewhere out there, far beyond this place. We're reptile aliens made of life. Cut you open, pull out all your pain. Tell me how you make it legal, something that I'll make in our brain. Say you might go crazy Then again it might make you go insane Every time you take a look Inside that old fable book Blinded and reminded of Pain caused by some old man in the sky There are pillars Still aside, the end, the option, we ask, love's the only thing that ever saved my life. Don't waste your mind on nursery rhymes, fairy tales, blood and wine, turtles all the way down the line. So to reach the realms, we go home, but the realms our souls must know, to and through. I think it's hard sometimes to be around folks who have a completely different understanding of how things work and what ultimate truth entails. The best any of us can do is to come up with a hypothesis that fits whatever evidence we have at the time. We just do what we can with what we've got. But as religious folks, perhaps we are enjoined to be kind to one another, especially to those who do not share our personal understandings. Maybe we can give one another the benefit of a doubt because the chances are high that we are each just doing the best we can with the evidence we have. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.